The approaching millennium has fanned the flames of a curious phenomenon. UFO cults. A synthesis of mainstream religion and cutting-edge science fiction. The belief in these technological angels comes from a long history of mankind's faith in a divine plan for the universe. The emergence of these UFO-obsessed groups became news around the world when 39 members of the Heaven's Gate cult committed suicide in Rancho Santa Fe, California in 1997. Survivors of Heaven's Gate provide true stories which read like sci-fi novels. A cult leader's daughter tells of her mother's search for UFOs. A mother of a suicide victim describes her son's alien transformation. Members of another group, the Unarius Academy, just down the road from Rancho Santa Fe, drive to a secret UFO landing site where they claim 33 spaceships will arrive in the year 2001. How can we interpret this mania to seek contact with an alien race? Is it simply the human need to believe in the unexplained? A moment ago when I said that the big surprise could come that spacecrafts could come in by the thousands, maybe come in shifts. In March 1997, Marshall Applewhite, the leader of Heaven's Gate, told his followers there was a UFO in the tail of the Hale-Bopp Comet, which orbits the Earth once every 2,000 years. He convinced them that this was their signal to board the flying saucer, which would take them into eternity. In order to catch this ride, the 39 cult members committed suicide by a combination of phenobarbital, alcohol, and suffocation. For reasons that still remain unanswered, they wore Nike running shoes, sported buzz haircuts, and carried five dollars of quarters in their pockets. This tragedy was the culmination of 22 years of behavior modification under Marshall Applewhite's spell. What once started out as a grassroots Christian sect evolved into a dark millennial cult with beliefs in aliens and Armageddon. So when they presented the picture of being able to literally leave uh, in a craft, so to speak, which they were saying was similar to what Jesus did. He actually left in a physical body. When they overlaid that with modern day technological information, like that cloud of light was a UFO, it all lined up for me. Early on, Marshall Applewhite and his co-leader, Bonnie Nettles, had convinced themselves and their followers that they were God's emissaries, here to lead humanity out of a corrupt world. Applewhite said he and Nettles had come from outer space, taking on human bodies as camouflage. They offered salvation to members who could overcome their attachment to human desires such as sex, money, and drugs. Where did this desperate and bizarre mixture of sci-fi and millennial madness begin? Before Marshall Applewhite and Bonnie Lou Nettles became so-called alien agents, they were living separate lives of quiet desperation. Their twisted partnership began some 25 years earlier in Houston. Bonnie's daughter, Terry Nettles, recalls when she was 14 years old, she and her mother would stand in their backyard searching the skies for UFOs, hoping they would be transported. It would be really neat if one would come and pick us up and take us away, because neither one of us really felt like we were part of this world, that we were always on the outside looking in. And we used to dream about that a lot. We wanted something different. At the same time, in nearby Corpus Christi, Marshall Applewhite's perfect life began to unravel. 
His 16-year marriage dissolved and his career as a college music professor ended when he was accused of a sexual relationship with a male student. Then Applewhite met Bonnie Lou Nettles just as her 23-year marriage was ending as well. They met in 72 at the theater I used to work at. He was teaching music and drama. It started out with my mom doing astrology charts for the mothers. And I remember her telling me, uh, we were in the living room, that there was something about his chart, something there that was a lot different than somebody else's. From the start, her relationship with Marshall Applewhite was based on a spiritual connection that shunned sex. They turned their new age and Christian ideologies into a business and went searching for followers. While Nettles recited the Bible inside and out, Applewhite, also known as Herf, was the charming front man. On New Year's Day, 1973, Applewhite and Nettles set out on what they called a spiritual road trip. Though Bonnie Nettles left her daughter and son behind with her ex-husband, she wrote to Terry regularly. After a year on the road, their unorthodox gospel began to take shape. July 26, 1973. Dearest Terry, we have finally come out of the wilderness to know what our mission is. It is definitely a big one. In fact, we have been sent to fulfill the scriptures the same as Jesus and others came to do. This has been revealed in John's revelations. I am not kidding, baby. This is for real. I knew it was something very important from the very beginning. Along the way, they had financial difficulties, and Applewhite was arrested in Kansas for stealing a rental car. During his six-month jail sentence, he fine-tuned his doctrine. Upon Applewhite's release, he and Nettles contacted UFO researcher Hayden Hughes in hope of spreading their message. Herf Applewhite said, Hayden, you could do our mission a tremendous service by whatever means you have available to you, by simply stating that they are two individuals here to show that death can be overcome like Jesus did 2,000 years ago. And they compared it much like a caterpillar turning into a butterfly, that their life here would go through a metamorphosis into a level above humans. They called their group Human Individual Metamorphosis. By the fall of 1975, Applewhite and Nettles gave themselves names like Bo and Peep, Guinea and Pig, or Doe and T, notes in the musical scale. They also referred to themselves as the Two, based on the two witnesses in the Book of Revelations, who were slain and then ascended into heaven. At their recruitment meetings all across the country, they were extremely persuasive with their sci-fi pitch to potential members. That was so intriguing to me as what was it, what combination came together that compelled people literally to, you know, as in the apostolic age, you know, that these, this was Peter and James and John and, and Matthew suddenly leaving their work and following the teacher. We had the same situation here. They simply said, come with us, and they did. Applewhite even convinced people he could communicate telepathically through secret codes of thought. He said, uh, Mr. Hughes, if you ever need to get a hold of me, uh, gave me a secret code, which was mentally praying to Bonnie and Herf with the Lord's Prayer. And then about 14, 15 months later, there was widespread publicity about some people that disappeared in Oregon after attending a UFO lecture. So I decided to use the code. Then the next morning received a telephone call. And when he said, you have now asked, I thought, well, maybe these people are, you know, who they say they are. Human individual metamorphosis attracted a number of veterans of the fading hippie counterculture. Most of the members had been involved in other religious endeavors. Um, Est, Transcendental Meditation, Tarot Cards, Astrology, they were religious seekers for the most part. In order to keep the business going, members sold blood at blood banks and asked for contributions from Christian bookstores. Some wealthy members gave their trust funds to the group. 
One of the early recruits was 19-year-old David Moore, to the utter amazement of his mother, Nancy Brown. When David came to say goodbye, I, I was observing him very closely to see if he showed any signs of being, uh, you know, a little off balance or being, you know, kind of wild-eyed or not making sense. But he seemed very calm, and he told me that um, this was something that, that spoke to him in a way that nothing that he had come across before had. Applewhite and Nettles hated the attention of reporters, whom they believed asked annoying questions about Applewhite's past and the cult's financial situation. In 1976, the group went underground, living on campgrounds in so-called good energy states, like Colorado, California, and Arizona. So we isolated ourselves in this small group of 60 or 70 people and we didn't have contact with our families. We were isolated into a circumstance where we could then focus on our change and there was a continual emphasis on the urgency that we uh, make our change over quickly because we wanted to be ready when they came. One woman said to, her, said to us that she uh, when she bought toothpaste, she'd always buy a small tube because she'd expect to be leaving shortly. But then she said wistfully once, well, I'm always buying another tube. <laughs> As they anxiously awaited their exit, the group struggled to be like angels, denying their sexuality as well as their individuality. Marshall Applewhite was promiscuous in his early life, and he saw sexuality as bad giving him hard time. So he had to find a way to reckon with this. Applewhite tried to exert strict control over the members of the group. At the same time, Nancy Brown began to publish a newsletter, creating a network for the shunned families. One of the group members visited his mother, who was in the network, and saw this newsletter, and uh, either took this newsletter with him, or at least told T and Doe and the group about it. Well, apparently they were really startled and not pleasantly pleased. They looked at her as kind of like a meddler, somebody that was just making trouble. And, and the way Marshall Applewhite thought was she was an agent of the lower forces. <laughs> And uh, it's, it's very, it's kind of humorous looking back at it now, but at the time it was like a very serious thing because there was this feeling that we'd get from uh, Marshall Applewhite that somebody was out to get us. You know, somebody was going to take us down, take us off track, not allow us to complete our mission. Sensing the newsletter might encourage parents to come after their children, Applewhite and Nettles reluctantly allowed members to contact their families. It was carefully controlled. Nancy Brown heard from her son David Moore through messages left on her answering machine. Hello, this is your uh, son David. Uh, if you want to know how you can help uh, these parents who want to hear from someone on the trip, uh, if you would uh, print in your newsletter the names of those parents, who will promise not to kidnap their uh, family members or uh, keep them from doing what they want to do, I'll promise you that most of these parents will hear from their loved ones pretty quickly. And uh, I don't want you to worry about me because there's really nothing to worry about. The early 80s, cracks were beginning to appear in the walls of the cult, which was now called Heaven's Gate. Many longtime members felt confused and quit. Terry Nettles started to sense her mother's doubts in her letters. The letter in 82 that I got from my mom gave me the impression that I felt like she wanted out or that she no longer believed it. It was something to the effect of, you know, be sure and conform to society, follow all the rules. And I thought, why is she saying these things? This isn't what she would have said to me a few years ago. In 1984, Bonnie Lou Nettles was diagnosed with brain cancer. Admitted into a hospital under an assumed name, she died alone in her native state of Texas. 
Applewhite never informed Bonnie's children of her illness or death until several months later. She was only a few hours away from me, so nobody even bothered to call me to um, tell me that my mom was dying so that I could be there with her. Nothing. My entire insides felt like it had been ripped out, and I, I spent many nights waking up the next day with my pillow soaking wet because I would just cry through the night. Though Marshall Applewhite carried on without his beloved Bonnie Nettles, Doe, as he was called, was shaken by T's death. It put not just Doe to the test, but it put all of us to the test of, of our commitment to the next level. Do we think this is real or do we think this is just a, a, a con game? How could a messenger of God die and her body remain on earth? Marshall Applewhite had to quickly revise his doctrine. He or they needed to kind of account for what happened to her. They contemplated the idea that one could achieve this spiritual transcendence through some other means than just physically going there in UFOs, that suicide was, was an option. At her work, because it's not the one that she, that the old influences or the old vehicles, impulses would respond to. So frequently this is what we do. To maintain his role as the supreme and all-knowing leader, Applewhite enforced strict regulations that would further squelch free choice. Regimentation, daily life, measuring of food, rigid rules when they went out to the external world to work, not to interact with people. It was all to become more and more focused as if they were on a spacecraft leaving and if you were out in the outer world you were out of craft if you were in the house doing routines that was in craft Applewhite began to question the obedience of his members in the past he had distanced himself from other men in the group to avoid his homosexual urges now he asked the men to join him in castration Marshall Applewhite was talking about how far would you go in order to attain your mission? And so he uh, evidently was entertaining, castrating himself, getting rid of the, the human need to reproduce or that hormonal impulse to be attracted to the opposite sex or to be attracted to any sex. I started going, Whoa, I, I don't know, I, I can't really uh, go for this. Michael Conyers did not undergo the procedure, but Applewhite and six other men in the cult flew to Mexico City and were surgically castrated. In the early 90s, Marshall Applewhite used the internet to spread his gospel to the outside world. He began designing personal websites, calling the company a higher source. Eventually, they were earning nearly $400,000 a year. With this income, they recruited new members by placing a full-page ad in USA Today and other newspapers. Doe got instruction to relate to the world again and go out and collect any of the so-called uh, second wave or anyone who was ready for this transition that didn't come aboard the first time around. Now, everything was interpreted as a warning signal from above. At a campground in California, the cult thought the sky offered a message of impending doom. The forest fires in the area had created this kind of blood red sky, and the sunset and the sun was bright red. So they interpreted that through a biblical passage that said, the end times are near. In March of 1997, the comet hale -Bopp was nearing Earth's orbit for its first visit in 2,000 years. Applewhite prophesied a UFO was following in the tail of the comet. He said, it's the marker we've been waiting for, the spacecraft from the level above human to take us home to the literal heavens. I know that Doe and the class felt like that the comet itself was significant that this was a next level's way of saying, okay, let's wrap, let's wrap it up here. The Higher Source website posted a cryptic red alert message on the internet. 
the cult had sent letters and videotaped messages via FedEx to several old friends. Let me say that our mission here at this time is about to come to a close in the next few days. <clears throat> we came from distant space and even what some might call somewhat of another dimension and we're about to return from whence we came. On March 26th, 39 bodies were found in Rancho Santa Fe, California. You can follow us, but you cannot stay here and follow us. You would have to follow quickly by also leaving this world before the conclusion of our leaving this atmosphere in preparation for its recycling. They had exited their vehicles in much the same way that they had entered them. I was so happy to hear that they were finally off this planet, that they finally got out of those vehicles. And I just wished that I was with them at that moment. A friend of mine called me at work and told me, you know, I said, it's just another cult. She says, no, you got to understand. She says, there's this guy named Father Doe, and there's a spaceship on that Hellbop Comet. And I totally lost it. You know, this has been part of your life, you know, and Herf has died with all the answers to the questions you've had. When my phone rang, up till that point, I had left open every hope that David was involved because the media still didn't have the factual information that would confirm it. But as soon as I heard that first sentence, I knew all was lost. Six weeks later, Heaven's Gate member Chuck Humphrey tried to take his life, but police managed to save him. I wished that I was with them. It's not really a regret in the sense that, uh, gee, I lost my chance at a million dollar lotto because I lost the, the ticket or I didn't play today. It's more of a, of a kicking myself for not having done enough of my own homework. As long as I'm still here, I can't do anything but share what I know about the next level and about Heaven's Gate. What is it about human nature that causes some people to literally put their lives in the hands of another? 13-year member Michael Conyers recalls the first time he met Applewhite. The energy that I felt from him put me into a state of almost fear and awe because when somebody says and starts owning that he may be or kind of is a representative of the kingdom of heaven, there's kind of an energy that's exchanged between the two people. It's like there's a charge that goes on. Hank Hanegraaff of the Christian Research Institute consults cult members and their families. He sees Heaven's Gate as the latest example of spiritual con men at work. So often they follow a leader who is presenting them the skin of the truth stuffed with a deadly lie. I don't think that there's a more classic current case of that than Herf Applewhite. And when he told them that they had been impregnated with an alien spirit and that's why his message resonated with them. They were immediately willing to follow the seductive siren call of the cult leader and in this case follow it right to their deaths. The lure of Heaven's Gate was not just the security of belonging to a group. It was the promise of a UFO taking that group to a better world. For people that have a particularly strong case of alienation, this can become a, a very powerful uh, segment of your life. There is a vision of another kind of world in which we could live a lot better and maybe the UFO can, uh, can take us there. Applewhite had led his followers here and there, changing their course as his own personal demons dictated. Finally, time ran out on him. In the case of Heaven's Gate, uh, originally the shift was to a, a waiting mode. Uh, we are waiting, and we, during this time of waiting, we will prepare ourselves. We'll purify ourselves. We'll cleanse ourselves. We'll make ourselves beings fit for the spaceship when it finally arrives. 
um, that's a dangerous mode because uh, eventually you have to give up the waiting. For Marshall Applewhite, the exotic comet gave him an opportunity to take his life. For his deluded and estranged followers, it was the end of their journey.